welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 803rd New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege today of being your MC for a conversation featuring Almin Reich Picasso and Phyllis Tuckman. We're also thrilled to welcome poet Michael Kelleher here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsi, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we're speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Almin Reich Picasso opened a gallery with an associate in Marais in Paris in November 1989. Five years later, Reich Picasso opened her own gallery in a new space in Paris, and she now has galleries in major cities, including Brussels, London, New York, and Shanghai. And our host today, critic and art historian Phyllis Tuckman, teaches and writes about art, particularly sculpture. She has taught at Williams College, Hunter College, and the School of Visual Arts. She is also an editor at large here at the Brooklyn Rail. And we are so grateful and honored to have Phyllis and Almin here today. And I'm excited to pass it over to you, Phyllis. Thanks. Thank you very much. Almin, I, I have always wondered, I started going to art galleries when I was in high school and it was very easy coming to New York from Passaic, I would take the bus that Robert Smithson made famous. So I grew up in New York art galleries, but it seems to me starting an art gallery in, in, in France, particularly in Paris, must be very different than starting a gallery in New York, which you have also done. Yes. Yeah, it's different. Well, I started quite long ago, and uh, it's the of course the the market in 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 Europe because it's difficult to compare France with the U.S. because uh, U.S. is uh, like big like Europe, so the market in Europe is not the same than uh, in the the U.S. one. I mean, New York is the leading city for art market since the 1940s, I guess, and it's still that way. So it's, it's a bit more difficult uh, to start a gallery um, in Paris, although Paris now becomes very important, but that's many years after I opened. It was more difficult, yes. But it was very interesting. We have great institutions, but the, it's it's not quick and energetic like in New York, of course. And is it harder to get artists to show? Was it harder to get artists to show in Paris initially? No, uh, always Paris was quite attractive to artists because they like the context of uh, what Paris has been uh, in the 20th century, at least until uh, just after Second World War, it was like the main city for art in the world, and I mean, in, for Western art at least, and, um, and Paris is Paris. So, you know, the beauty of the city, all the museums. So it was never difficult to, in the contrary, artists were happy to show in Paris. Okay, I, I'm trying to not say exact amount because my French accent is so bad. Um, <laughs> what, were things very different when, when the currency went from francs to euros? Did that, did that change anything? That was better because you, you know, when, when I started, um, we had to discuss with every collector of the, the, the currency of their country compared to dollar or French franc, you know, it was a nightmare. There was like a, 
like minimum five or six major currencies uh, we had to deal with because collectors were from like Belgium, uh, um, Holland, uh, Germany, I mean, uh, Italy, Spain. <laughs> it was difficult. We were never in agreement on, on the currency rate. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So the, the euro did good. Wow. Um, I, I also, I asked you this the other day. I mean, having been to, I love Brussels. I love Antwerp, um, but I love Brussels, but I've never understood opening galleries in Brussels. Barbara, for example, Barbara Gladstone owned, uh, opened there. Yeah. And is that a strange place to, to have a gallery? Not really. It's quite, I mean, uh, Belgium and uh, also all this area, you know, uh, um, Holland, south of Germany has always had lots of collectors. That's why they do the, the it seems strange, for instance, that they do a, a fair in Maastricht, you know, it's, a, it's an encyclopedic fair, like from uh, prehistorical works to to middle age to now, but why did they do it in, in Maastricht? Because it's at the center of this triangle in Europe where you have many, you have lots of collections and lots of collectors because Maastricht is even more uh, unexpected than Brussels, of course. And so, and me, I opened in Brussels in a way, <clears throat> you're right, I, I don't think I would have if we had not had to live for a few years in Brussels. And in the beginning, I was like taking the train, uh, like uh, staying two days from of the week in Paris and coming back, you know. And then I realized it's very, it's not good. I must have a gallery in here and, uh, and it's okay to have it also in Paris and have the two. And that was good because it was the start of internationalizing the gallery. Then after I did London and then, then Shanghai and New York. So it was like the start of uh, not being in one place. And you've had pop-ups, am I correct? You've had pop-ups in Aspen and in Venice. Yeah, well, in Venice, it's almost getting permanent now. Well, I don't know how it will be in the future, but we are continuing to have this Palazzo Cavanis, which we love, and people go a lot there. We have thousands of visitors, and, uh, and so we continue it. Uh, Aspen was absolutely great. We were very happy there. But we did it once, and now we, we, we have links with some of the collectors, so it's not really needed. We do it uh, as a permanent. It was a very nice pop-up, very successful. Oh, and it's such a beautiful town. Can we go, yeah. back, can we go back to the, the, no, the red one? So I happen to be a James Terrell groupie. I like to go to oh. different cities to see James Terrell. Um, when you uh, showed this piece in 2013, did people line up on the street the way they do in uh, New York? Well, it was, uh, did, I had big lines uh, at the fer very first one, and this one was very successful too. But already I had shown uh, James uh, a few times, like this was maybe the fifth or wow. uh, show I, I, I was doing in Paris. So, yeah, but it was not the lines like the two first ones, let's say, where people discovered because at first when I showed James, he never had had a, a light piece in the gallery in, in Paris, you know, even in Europe. He had had a few museum shows and Otherwise, some galleries had been showing uh, sketches from the crater and, you know, old works on paper, but never a real light piece. Yes. Wow. 
Yeah, I yeah. saw that Robert Lippman, who I knew way back when, bought bought from your first show of James Terrell. Yeah, it was it was a because that was my very first show ever. So oh. everybody was saying, "Oh, what what is that? You're not hanging anything on the wall. You're gonna bankrupt the first show." So I said, "Oh my God, it's too late anyway," and I wanted to do it, so I was doing it. And then it was a complicated, some French museum wanted to purchase it, but they did not have really the funds and they were fighting between curators and, and this. So I thought, oh my God, am I gonna sell it? And then Bob Littman came in, like uh, at maybe the 10 days before the show was over. And he said, I want to buy this piece. And of course, uh, he could, I said, yes, great. And I did not want to ask him any question uh, before all was said, you know, and everything. And once we were all set, I asked him, I said, why did you buy it in Paris? Because at the time in the 90s, um, Jim had his gallery in LA and uh, Ace Gallery at the time, which doesn't exist any longer. And uh, it's much closer to Bob because he lived in LA and he was buying it for a Mexican collection. And so he said to me, because I hate Ace Gallery. Oh, that's <laughs> <a good reason. laughs> so I, I understood was my first sale ever. I understood it's a bit uh, complicated in the art world about who <laughs> likes yeah. That's fabulous. Can we go back to the the first one? And and this is this did oh I, I'm looking at the shoes. People didn't have to wear booties. Uh yeah, I think they took away their shoes, no? Oh they did. Okay. I think yeah, usually they put those uh, like hospital things on the they take or over the Boots, over their shoes, maybe. But um, it's painted white on the floor, so they have to. I think first we're going to show uh, uh, some calders, but I'm going to come back to the James Terrell when we talk about your plastic show. Can yeah. we? Um, so I remember when you opened in New York, you had such a to die Calder Picasso show. But yes, thank you. also, oh my God, thank you for doing it. Um, so you also have access to a lot of Calders? Well, we the, the first New York show, Calder Picasso, it was an idea I had since uh, quite a while. And uh, finally, I proposed uh, uh, Sandy Rohr, the grandson who uh, takes care of the of the estate and Bernard uh, Picasso to do a curating, would they be okay to do something around the connections uh, between Calder and Picasso? And they agreed. So that's how, then it was like a long month of work because they were exchanging and uh, Sandy, the grandson of Alexander, Calder had a, a funny idea. He said, let's do it like if we had bought together a, um, a house in Tangiers. I don't know why Tangiers. Oh. And every time one of us go, they brings a work of his grandfather. And so that was how they made it. And, uh, and uh, we decided that we will not loan anything that the works would only come from the estates, from the two estates. So it was a very intimate and special show and we were very successful, I must say. People loved it, like you, Phyllis. And so we are very thankful to the response New York gave to that show. It was beautiful. So have you had, 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 had more than one Calder show? Yes, 
uh, I had then uh, the one we see images of right now in Avenue Matignon, which is a space we have uh, in a different area than Le Marais. With, uh, Avenue Matignon is uh, uh, near by Grand Palais where the Paris Plus fair happens. It's, it's close to Musée d'Art Moderne when the other area of galleries, Le Marais, is close to Centre Pompidou and Musée Picasso. It's two opposite. It's like if you would say, I don't know, Tribeca and Upper East Side. Uh, Matignon is like Upper East Side. Oh, I feel like it's where Dior is. Isn't that where Dior is? The fashion well, houses? Many brands are uh, not far from there, but they are Avenue Montaigne. Ah, okay. It's, it's close, close by. by. It's close yeah. by. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I, I, and it's kind of cool that your gallery is now um, at Madison and 78th Street, and you're, you're by the old Pearls Gallery where yeah. Calder did the sidewalk. True, true, yeah. It's, uh, well, we like a Paris side. It's a very historical place where galleries were since the 1930s. So it's very, we like it. And the scale, it's like on Avenue Matignon, the scale is not as big as uh, Chelsea or even Tribeca. And uh, it allows to do different type of curatings. It's, uh -huh. uh, it's not the same needs than a big, uh, very, very large yeah. space. So we have the next slides are by Jeff Koons. And, and did you have to make a special arrangement with Zwerner to show these? Oh, this was before Zwerner uh, was uh, working with Jeff. No, I worked directly with Jeff uh, since uh, I did a show prior to, to this one in Brussels also, a big solo show. It was always directly with Jeff. Jeff is very free. I mean, he's such an important, iconic artist. In a way, he can do what he wants. Well, and he's such a nice guy. I, I'm always like, really? Jeff, you're Jeff Koons and you're so sweet? Yeah. Yeah, he loves... He loves the contact with the public with like, for instance, when we have a show with him, we, we get many catalogs of his from us, but also from other shows and tons of people ask him to sign, you know, some uh, grandpas with uh, grandchildren come and they want him to sign to make a flower or whatever drawing on the book and in the end we have to stop him because first we get we don't have any more catalogs <laughs> and then it's really late to go to the dinner for the opening and so he's really generous with the public i'm sorry i'm near madison and it's i don't know what's happening they are <laughs> oh they are it's, getting mad it's new york new york yeah um, absolutely and now we have, I, I think, four sides of this plastic show that Dwayne Valentine did for you. I yeah. love, I love Dwayne. Yeah, he was the curator of this show, and also the blue piece you see in front is his. Then you have McCracken, and then it's um, Mary. Uh, oh my God, Course. I, Mary Course. Yeah, the light. Uh, box it was i loved that show and the way uh, did it very well he's great but oh. unfortunately he passed away he was a jam and oh, yeah. we, absolutely uh, we have two more two more images of this show which looks like it was sensational yes i loved it he, he chose every work and that we could, we had or we could get, and he he was uh, very close to all of the artists in the show. And uh, yeah, 
And it was all about this time with the Finnish fetish and the history of uh, uh, the, the LA scene and the desert and the sky, the UFOs, the ocean, the space. They were so free in LA. Wow. That's beautiful. And that the 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 big disc on the left, that's Dwayne. Which one? The big disc on the left. Um Is that Dwayne or Fred Eversley? It's Dwayne. Oh it's, okay. It's, it's uh, from uh I think 67. It's he's oh, this is from the show he had. I love that show. Yeah, it's, he 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 did he invented the the resin to do the sculptures and uh, Fred Eversley is younger, so he 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 buys and it's still uh, his resin that is produced and that artists buy today. He's the one who invented the this with the trans, translucent. Uh, um, resin that can be used and and stands and is not soft you know and becomes hard and can you can make even big sculptures like the blue column we saw before and Elmine, Elmine are you surprised that you know we're such a big country and you had to bring all of this from California yeah well, you know, I started with James, so the, the LA scene and all the artists working there uh, interested me very much. Then I, I worked with uh, John McCracken. I went to, to visit him and, uh, and that was the, the beginning of uh, my uh, program. It was uh, basically James and John. And uh, I, I love the California uh, light, light and space movement. Wow. I, yeah. Uh, I, I can get myself in trouble because I'm such an inveterate New Yorker. Um, we, we have two sides from, from, from Joseph Kasuth. Yeah, the library. Oh, yeah. It was Are a beautiful show. Are, are there some artists, American artists that you show, like Joseph Kasuth, who are more popular in Europe than they are in America? Uh, well, yeah, Joseph is popular in Europe. I think everybody knows him in America too, because he, he did many shows with Leo Castelli since a very, well, long time ago. And, uh, but right now, uh, you know, conceptual art is not really what people look at, but there are, you know, it's always like this. At some point it's abstraction, figuration, conceptual art, you know, people love something becomes very trendy and some other aspects are quite forgotten and then they come back. I think it's just like that. It comes and goes, but Joseph is obviously very important. When you go to art school, uh, you have to learn about Kusut. Yeah, exactly. I feel like he, he went through one of those periods where we didn't think about, about him and then yeah. he entered history. Exactly, exactly. Which is amazing. So now we're going to show two absolutely amazing Sean Scully. And can you talk a little bit about being able to live at Chateau de bois -Jaloup? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, the, the, well, you know, when there was the, the Picasso, um, when he passed away, the, he had a few houses. So some were more uh, legitimate to go to some hairs and some, so my husband inherited the Boisjoloup. 
So we, we, we go there quite often. It's very close to Paris in the, the beginning of Normandy in the west of Paris. It's like one hour drive. So it's a beautiful house. Well, Picasso always loved beautiful houses. You know, he had Boisjoulou, and he had uh, a house like Vouvenard, which is one of the most beautiful uh, 17th century castles in the south of France. And um, yeah, and then that's where he had his uh, sculpture studio, Boisjoulou. So at some point, I proposed Bernard because the, we, we kept that you see the, the open door is uh, leading to the studio and the next door on, the, on its left too. Um, and so I proposed him that this studio is exactly as it was and it was always empty. And sometimes it was like with some furniture storage and I said, that's too bad because uh, it's such a place. We could do some shows. So in the beginning, he was very reluctant because this is his childhood uh, home for holidays, you know? And so it's very private. So he said, oh, no, I'm not sure. And I said, let's do a one night. So we did the first group show I organized was uh, like one evening in Boisjoulou. So it was one day. And then, in fact, he loved it. So then little by little, we started, uh, um, I, I, I organized other shows with other artists, including this one with uh, uh, Sean Scully. So what you saw is uh, on the left is the chapel where was the first image with the paintings. And now this is outdoor, this is the chapel, yeah. And then inside the studio, there was also works. And uh, in the do dove coat where, you know, they used to have the, the doves, there was a sculpture too. It's a round, it's a very beautiful uh, place, Wajelou. And wow. it, yeah, it's such a memory, a historical place, you know, so. Yeah. And I read that 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 the chateau has Picasso's old car, the one that I think he he drove from the south of France when he went to Vogard's funeral. But I would imagine you can't drive the car anymore. Yes, yes, yes. All the cars are in perfect condition. We restore no. them. We drive them, but not far away because they're so big. It's the Hispano Suiza. There is a, a photo, it's too bad. I, we should have provided you a very famous photo by Brassai because Boisjoulou was some, not known at all. And it would not be as known if Brassai, who was very young, was working for art magazine. He was like in his twenties and the art magazine said, oh, you should go to photograph and make, uh, we make a portfolio of, a Picasso um, studio that was in the 1920, late 1920s. And uh, it, no, it was in 1930, I think, or 31. And he went, he did that. And since that time, you can find on internet the Brassai photos of Boisjoulou Sculpture Studio. And this made the studio famous visually, I mean. Anyone can go on internet and check the Brassai. And they, they became very friend because for the first time, uh, Picasso thought, oh, your photos of sculptures are great. And no photographer was ever able to do nice sculptures photo for me. So then they became very close and Brassai would do all the sculptures photos for Picasso uh, for, until oh, lifelong. Yeah, they're wonderful. Yeah. Plus yeah, because, the book he wrote. I love the book he wrote. Yeah, The Conversations with Picasso. It's a great book. Yeah. Oh, my God. You're so lucky to live this part of history. Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I'm knocking on wood. Um, we're now going to uh, show a bunch of slides of artists who you show. And um, 
can you tell me a little bit about I, Zio Ziegler? Zio, Zio Ziegler is a young artist, well, quite young, that um, one of my directors showed me images a while ago. Uh, and I must say, I was like quite impressed by the construction of the of the paintings, the way he, and also the connection with modern art, you know, Picasso in a way, and also some surrealist aspect. And, uh, and then we did the first uh, group show and then I really liked him. So we started, we represent him now and he's very successful. Well, we well that's good. Yeah, we had museums by the work, and uh, no, it's uh, he's it rem a, reminds me of a jumbled up George Kondo. Yeah, well, it's very different than George. George is really uh, like, in a way, if Picasso did not uh, was not there, George is really uh, related to Picasso very much and, uh, and, he, and in a great way. I mean, it's very difficult to challenge uh, Picasso. So Kondo did it very well. I think it's, well, you can see connections between artists, yes, of course, but they are very different, I guess. And have you shown, have you shown him in, in, in your gallery in New York or just at the uh, ADA? Uh, ADAA was a solo show. Um, did we show him already? Uh, I don't know, but oh. uh, we, we're going to show him anyway. I can't remember all the program. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's like, I, I don't know how you keep all those galleries straight. I mean, Paris, New York, London, Brussels, Shanghai. Oh my God, that's so many languages. Yes. Yeah. Everybody speaks English, by the way. <laughs> That's good. Uh, and it used to be English, English. Now it's American English. Yes, um, I, I know. To me, that's the most magical thing. Um, we're now going to show Alexandra Lenoir. Yeah, French artist. Yeah. And are these abstract? I mean, you seem to have a very interesting program where you rotate between representational art and abstraction, like the current show right now. Yes, absolutely. Andrea Mari Brailing, yeah, she's completely abstract, if that's the name of this uh, uh, type of paintings. And Le Noir is a bit in between because his work is very related to his personal memories. He's uh, from the French Caribbean. Um, and he was raised there, but he lives in Paris. And he has all his use was uh, very, um, he, uh, the, uh, it's all about nature because of the Caribbean nature and the way you perceive it, water, the, the kind of jungle, and also the fact that his father is French. So there is a relation probably with uh, like a, a kind of impressionism, but it, it's totally different. Uh, it's completely contemporary. And we will do a big solo show at Armory Show in September. Okay. So, yeah. And uh, no, he, he, he's, it, it's what you say, it can be said abstract, but you see here, you see a waterfall uh, on some rocks, and this is more uh, representational, but uh, some are more abstract. It's a lot about nature and the way you, you immerse, immerse in it. Uh, and now we have some slides from Nathaniel Mary Quinn. Yeah. That was our London show. And why did you show these in London? Well, you know, it's always interesting for artists to change uh, the, the, 
the space, they have, uh, it's very interesting to them often. So we had uh, showed him uh, in Brussels and, uh, and we proposed him London. His wife is initially from London. So his wife has family there, so they like London. And it was a very beautiful show based on, on only that piece that you show is like uh, his mother. Well, if you can say it represents his mother, but yeah. uh, and, and the rest of the show was all about uh, characters from uh, movies. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, so that's why it says scenes. Yes, absolutely. Got it. I love yeah. it. Um, we have three more artists to race through um, before uh, we open this up to questions. I had never heard of Genesis Tremaine. Yeah, well, I'm happy you, you discover her. Uh, she's a, she's a New York uh, artist. Oh. And um, I, I discovered her in connection with uh, Nathaniel Quinn. Uh -huh. uh, at some point he had mentioned her, but you know how things are. You, you don't have always time to, to look at everything or things someone tells you. And then I decided to go visit her. And uh, it was quite incredible because I had time only quite late in the day. And it was in the winter in New York because I was going back to Europe very quickly. And so it was completely dark. I went to Newark. She was working at the beginning in a, in a kind of uh, factory where other people were doing uh, mill work and things like that. She had a small space and it was so dark. She put light on, nobody was working in the building at that hour. And I was like very impressed. Uh, and she's, uh, she's someone very spiritual. It's connected to her beliefs in uh, and the way she's, she's uh, very, she's religious. She goes to church and she gets a lot of inspiration from uh, those moments. She needs to be very quiet uh, uh, before she starts a new series. And um, she's a devotional artist. I don't know if you can say that that way. Yeah. And um, I like her a lot. And uh, she's very, well, she's very successful now. Wow, and, I can't wait to see them in person. Yes, you have to see. And there are words written on the sides, you don't see them here, which are uh, like uh, parts of prayers or things she, she has in mind when she makes the painting. Huh, too much. Um, yeah. And we have uh, two slides from Emma Stern. Yes, Emma. I, I love Emma. She's totally in uh, another world than Nathaniel Quinn or uh, Genesis Tremaine. She's, uh, she, her works looks like digital, but they are not at all. It's completely hand painted and it's coming from a very like uh, nowadays culture, you know, of uh, not like in the past, it's the same type of popular culture than the, in the past cartoons could uh, give uh, some subjects to like uh, Liechtenstein or now it's more like uh, games, uh, video games or other uh, things that replace uh, cartoons or, um, you know, uh, bande dessinée, I don't even remember the name in English. Now it's more, all is more from 
the world of um, of digital world, you know, like totally different characters than what we that was nourish in the past was nourishing uh, Papa, you know, and Absolutely. she's great, and she, I love her, and she's very she's in a kind of feminist, but uh, she puts forward the, the, the aspect that sex appeal and also uh, being very free. And it's a kind of new feminism, which I like very much. She's great. Wow, She's what a great, great person too. And, and uh, before we, we, we open it up to questions, we have these two slides by Amanda Wall. Yeah, Amanda. And these look astonishing. Yeah, I love Amanda. She, Amanda is incredibly gifted. She started to paint without any school. She's self-taught. Wow. But yeah, it's just unbelievable how gifted she is. And her work, like the, the one on the left, I mean, the portrait there, you would imagine, especially the one on the left, that she did uh, studies, you know, because the way the, the, the painting is constructed, the way the body is represented in a very strange position. And she does uh, that often in different ways. She did a new show uh, with us, uh, and it was just incredible in uh, Brussels. And well, it's in a group show. She's quite, she's also like Emma, but totally with a different uh, uh, sources, you know. Uh, she's also this kind of new, new woman. Like today, women artists, they are, they know that they can do a career. It's not like in the past that it was extremely challenging and galleries would not show women and et cetera, like in the 70s or 60s, even 80s. And now they are very audacious and old because you can do a career as a woman. And uh, well, I love that. And I love to show women artists when I feel there is uh, something strong there, you know, in the work. That's uh, typically Amanda. That's fab. Thank you so much. I hope you don't mind taking one or two questions. Of course, of course, if there is. It was so enlightening. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much, Almin, and thank you, Phyllis, for those great questions. That was such an inspiring and exciting conversation. And we do have some great questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to unmute our first audience member who would like to ask a question. Is that me? Yes. Uh, hello, I mean, my name is Brett De Palma and I was curious uh, as an American painter, what sorts of criteria you use to uh, find and choose talent. Uh, say, for instance, uh, do you do you talk and and ask your current artists about who they follow? And as opposed to say the market, which drives so much of what's seen in galleries and in competition with art fairs and auction houses, how do you, as a gallerist, uh, make your decisions about what to show? Well, you know, when you are since a long time in, in this business, uh, you hear a lot of things. Uh, and I try to like among that with persons I, I kind of trust or I like what they say. And I always go to the studio. That's the way I, that's the criteria. And you know, if at the studio, if there is first a good human link, like if the thing, I don't know how you say it in English, like the, 
there is something that happens between the artist and me, uh, then it's a good sign. And of course, if I like the, the work I see in the studio, it's very simple in a way. And I think uh, after many years in this business, um, it's like in any other works, you, you kind of have a good experience which, which, which can give you the possibility to let your intuition function. And you are very free. You can follow your intuition because you have enough experience. Of course, it doesn't work every time. Sometimes it's a choice that after years, I think, oh my God, I did well. And sometimes it happens that I say, oh, I'm a bit disappointed, whatever. But uh, that's the, the good thing about having experience and a, a long time in, that, in, in one field is that your intuition, in the beginning, you are a bit afraid with your intuition. You want to try to rationalize. But then with time, you don't care about being rational. You, you can follow your intuition because you have enough experience. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Almin. Thank you for that great question. Um, we have just two more questions for you, Almin. So the next one is from Bo Ott, and I'll ask on their behalf. Bo is asking, the exhibitions at Almin's galleries are so beautiful. Does Almin have any plans for another Dwayne Valentine exhibition? If so, where? I would love to do a Dwayne show. I love the Dwayne. The, the problem is always the time and the states gets together, you know, and, uh, and then you can, uh, you can start again. I hope soon. Uh, it's been a bit difficult because there was a f uh, another uh, family before uh, the actual uh, wife who is now the widow. She's so nice. But I think things are going to be cleared and I hope we do a, a, another show. It would be great. Yeah. And, yeah. and also it would be also an homage to Dwayne and we were really friends. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Um, the next question will be from Chloe. Hi, Almin. Hi, Phyllis. Thank you so much for this amazing conversation today. Uh, it's been lovely to hear you speak to all of these incredible relationships with artists over the years and, and about the gallery. My question is, who was Almin before the gallery? Um, what led you to establish the gallery? And um, can you share a bit about your personal history and story uh, before founding the gallery? I'm also curious, among the artists that you've worked with, were there particular artists who inspired you to create an aesthetic sensibility that may or may not have helped in the establishment of the gallery? Well, I must say James Turrell was is the totally is the foundation of the gallery and of my work. Mm. It's my first artist, my first sale ever. <laughs> and we remain very close. I do projects with James uh, regularly uh, until now, you know, I mean, today I'm working on some projects with him. And this is a very long story. Mm. And, uh, and so, yeah. If I should say so, the most inspiring is, is uh, the relation with James. And uh, what, well, before that, I did some studies. Uh, I, I'm French from Paris. I did my studies in Paris, I mean, the, the university. And um, I was always uh, extremely interested by art. It's not something that came late since I'm a young child. And so I remember things I went to see with my father liked art. So I went to see at some museums near our home in Paris. I still remember, I was asking myself, like I was a young kid and I was asking myself, oh, what do you pref did you prefer in that 
show, you know, like a museum show or something. So it was always something that interested me and questioned. And I was also drawing. I was like the little family painter because I was quite gifted for doing portraits. But then I did not uh, decide to be an artist. I just was, I still do some, I don't have time anymore, but I did uh, like till not so long ago. And, um, and then I love also, also cinema. So mm -hmm. I hesitated between cinema and, uh, and painting. I mean, uh, plus, you know, uh, painter, sculpture. And um, so I did my studies about art and I, I for like two years, I took a major cinema. But then I decided, okay, no, I will do <laughs> the other. Uh, and I, I, I shifted for uh, painting, sculpture, drawings. So it was always, you know, uh, looking where, which, between cinema and, and art. I mean, cinema is an art, but uh, plastic art, let's say. I don't know how you say that in English, but it was always the subject. There was never another idea. So that's the story. It's, uh, it's uh, from very early. Do you find that you still think about cinema or are in dialogue with cinema as you work with? Yes, yes. I always love it. You know, it was so funny because one time in Paris, they did a big street event that was long ago and maybe 20, 15, 20 years ago, I don't remember. And they asked the galleries, some galleries, they had a big wall on the building and they said, we will do video projections. So choose an artist, put the video. And I was looking, looking, and I thought I must show something great. And every, many are great, but what is the greatest? And I could not find. And then I chose a little scene in the Potemkin of Eisenstein. That was the video I asked them to project. That way I had no more question in my head. I said, okay, that is my video. It's a little <laughs> two minutes, three minutes of uh, in Potemkin uh, from Eisenstein, which I mean, it's as beautiful and probably more as than many videos you can find. Incredible. Thank so you. I so love <laughs> cinema. <laughs> thank you so much for those answers. And thank you for this conversation today with Phyllis. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you so much, Chloe. Uh, that was, yeah. Those were great questions. Thank you so much again, Phyllis and Almin, for this incredible conversation. Um, we do have a tradition here at the rail of closing our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Michael Kelleher to the stage. Michael Kelleher's most recent book of poems is Visible Instruments from Chax Press. He is the director of the Wyndham Campbell Prizes at Yale. Thank you so much for being here today, Michael. Uh, thanks everybody for being here and uh, uh, thanks uh, to everyone at the Brooklyn Rail uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to do this reading. Um, I love the Brooklyn Rail. Um, I've been published I think three times over the course of maybe 20 years in the Brooklyn Rail. So it's it's actually been a really nice uh, home for my poetry. Um, and uh, also thank you to uh, Anselm Berrigan, the poetry editor who is a longtime friend. Um, I think I'm gonna read two poems today. Um, and, uh, I guess there's not much to say about them. They're pretty, they're pretty, they're, they're relatively apparent other than to maybe that they're both, um, pandemic poems that were written at a time when I was sitting at this desk that I'm sitting at now and you, you can't see it, but in front of me is a wall of, of books. And I spent a lot of time just staring at this wall of books, uh, over the course of several years. And, uh, it started to work its way into my, uh, my poetry and my imagination. Um, both of these are actually in the April, uh, issue of the rail. So you can read them there. The thing is, I went through this oppen thing but I got over it. And then I went through a Ginsburg thing, but I got over that too. 
Before that, I had an O'Hara thing that lasted a long time, but then it seemed like everyone had one of those things and I wanted something else. There was my Kerouac thing with lots of drugs and sex and booze. It was a time of high drama, not unlike my Keats thing, which was a time of always feeling near the edge of death, like my Plath thing. And there was my Susan Howe thing, which started when I read her Dickinson thing, and then I had a Dickinson thing too. It was a Puritan thing, like that book my mother gave me, a genealogical thing, in which, in addition to being Irish and Catholic and Brooklyn on one side, I was Protestant, Midwestern, and English on the other. And of course, I had a Yeats thing early on. The world was full of fairies and lovers and Maud gone. I thought a lot about the end of the world, like that time I went through a Lorca thing. It was tough being a poet alone in New York and my father dying that year. I wanted to join an insurrection somewhere. I went through an Eileen Miles thing, a Ted Berrigan thing, an Alice Notley thing. It was a New York school kind of thing. Only there was no school, just a bunch of poets writing about being poets in New York which was different from my Shelley thing, which was more like my Yeats thing or my Byron thing. And once I memorized a lot of Wordsworth and that became its own thing. I'd recite, I wandered lonely as a cloud to myself. I taught it to my daughter who could recite it by heart when she was three. I shot a video before she forgot the words. You should see it, she's very cute. But now she does her own thing. She hates it when I bring it up. And there was my Elizabeth Bishop thing, which differed from my Gertrude Stein thing, in which I repeated everything and everything I repeated became a kind of insistence in quotation marks because I'd read somewhere that she wanted to be listened to at dinner. And there was my Ed Roberson thing, which was a kind of atmosphere that bled into my Nathaniel Mackey thing which was also a headphone thing, a Googling of names of musicians thing. There was my Gottfried Ben thing, very cold, like a novel by Thomas Mann. But mostly I'm talking about poetry and Mann is a fiction thing, which is another thing altogether. And I can't forget to mention my Creeley thing, which began with my Olson thing. But like the Mackey thing and the Roberson thing or the Dickinson thing and the Howe thing, it became its own thing. And this thing was less epic than the Olson thing, less stentorian. It was a quiet thing, a thing between two people that is also part of other things. And had I thought the Creeley thing, I'm sorry, excuse me. And I thought the Creeley thing would be the end of this thing but it turns out I forgot a couple of things, like my Charles Bernstein thing, which was one of the funniest things ever. And lately I have been on this Chuspato thing. You probably haven't heard of Chuspato. She's a poet who writes in Galician, a language you probably didn't know exists, a romance language akin to Portuguese, banned by Franco, the fascist dictator of Spain but kept alive by poets and others who refuse to let the language die. And I'm not sure where this thing is going now. I don't want it to become a political thing, but sometimes that's unavoidable. Sometimes things just have a way of becoming political, even when the only thing you wanna do is write a poem. But the thing about poetry is that you can do a lot of things with it because it isn't just one thing. It is many things. So if the poem turns out to be a thing about how fucked America is, then that's just one of those things. Um, and so I'll read one more uh, shorter poem that is uh, also the result of staring at my bookcases. Um, and it's called uh, At the Movies with Lisa and John. I figure I'll keep on the movie thing uh, from the end of our conversation. 
Um, Lisa and John, in this case, are the poets Lisa Robertson and John Ashbery. Um, and I think I was reading both of them simultaneously when I wrote this poem. And uh, so I imagine the three of us went out to the movies together. At the movies with Lisa and John, Lisa says that noise is replete with historical significance, the hinge of ambiguity as the door swings wide. On the other side of it, John imagines himself not exactly dead, but buried alive as men wander the forest, recording indigenous sounds, an act of radical nostalgia given the abundance of noise invades even the most pristine acoustic environment. Lisa says she wants to be a plenum, and why not believe her? There is no such thing as silence, nor in nature a perfect circle, yet I map my heart's desire as if there were. Each small feeling reverberates with force enough to make the flower on John's lapel flutter as if a solar wind blew in from outer space. The screen dims. Lisa says, darkness is always contra, contingent on opposition. The ideal is everything at once, John retorts. Time felt as a child alone in a room, arms dangling off the bed, feels it. That kind of boredom. Lisa posits, the existence of the soul as a cone of sound that enters through the ear and becomes a mirrored cone of aural transformation. John laughs and hands me the rose from his lapel. Smell it, he says, and I do. Thanks. Thank you so much, Michael. That was amazing. So, so special. Such a great way to conclude. And Thank you so much again to Almin and Phyllis. We would also like to thank Candela and Clemence from Almin Reich, um, Almin Reich Gallery, Almin Reich Gallery for supporting today's event. And we would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring the NSC to make these daily conversations possible and for supporting our archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has been a platform for arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail and check out brooklynrail.org for the May issue, which has just gone live. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Christian Paul, Rachel Rawson, American artist, and Charlotte Kent on the event of Refigured at the Whitney. And we'll conclude tomorrow with a reading by Zoe Darcy. Um, Thanks to everyone for tuning in today. And you can now turn on your microphone and say hello and goodbye as you leave. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed that very much. Thank you, Thank Phyllis. You. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. That was great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Almin and Absentia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Reading. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank that you. was great. Michael. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.